Hi guys. Hi. Did you hear that one note that was the worst one I could possibly play? Like any other note would work so much better. Than that. <laughs> I thought you were going to get that heavy man. <laughs> that's that's you see I didn't make a mistake, I was just being fancy. Fancy pants. Fancy pants. So we're at Point of John where uh, Jesus is going to the cross. And when we get through this, we're gonna we're gonna get a little bit more into I really wanted to try to get into what this means, because if we don't understand what this means, why it matters, all it is is just a story. And if I say it entertaining, it might even be a, a good story, an enjoyable story. But if we don't understand the impact it actually has to transform lives, it's just a story, man. So in the, in the next few weeks, we're going to go through First uh, Peter and Ephesians uh, for the vineyard crew, not because the vineyard is doing it, but because me and Steve have been talking a lot about the similarities between those two, like you mentioned this morning, they have a lot to do with what our identity looks like in Christ. Anyways, um, I'm actually going to start this from Luke because it starts off just before the account does in John. And it says, Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed. And his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then the angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood, falling down to the ground. Did you hear that when we were in there? It was like the most inappropriate time for that to happen. <clears throat> so anyways, um, I've heard so many people, and, and they don't understand that this passage about you know, his, his uh, sweat became like drops of blood as he prayed. People are saying, was he really sweating blood? Was he praying so hard he was sweating blood? Is it just describing the sweat as it fell down and dripped like blood fell down? And uh, if we turn to the Greek as I like to do, we can get a much bigger, uh, better picture of the depth of what's happening here. So this is saying that, that Jesus was in agony. That word agony, it means a struggle, a fight, great exertion of effort, anguish, pain, distress, conflict. So, I mean, he was hurting. The dude was tore up. And that's why he's saying, Father, if it's possible, take this away from me. But nevertheless, if this is what you want me to do, I will do it. If there's any other way, I'm asking you for it. I cannot even imagine the spiritual warfare that he was going through right here in the garden. So it says that he prayed more earnestly. Earnestly means to be extended or to be stretched. And the picture is that someone who's pushed to the limit and can't possibly endure anymore. He is praying as hard as he can. He is mentally and spiritually stretched to the absolute limit that he can go without breaking. And so it says that his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Um, drops is a Greek word that no one cares what it actually is. And it's a medical word that uh, uh, points to blood that is unusually thickly clotted. And sweat is the word hydros, which actually holds some more meaning to us because we find hydrosis at the end of a lot of medical diagnoses. Uh, diagnosis is um, any kind of condition that involves a lot of sweat. Hydrosis is tapped on the end of that from the Greek hydros or sweat. So when the two are joined together, they depict a medical condition that is called hematidrosis. And it's a condition that occurs only in people who are in a highly emotional state. And what this is is because the mind is under such great mental and emotional pressure. It, the signals of stress that the brain sends out go through the whole entire body. And these signals become so strong that the body starts to react as if it were at, under actual physical pressure. As a result, what happens is the first and second layers of skin, they separate. And it causes a vacuum to form in between the two. And then thickly clotted blood, this word for drops, the thickly clotted blood, it seeps into this vacuum and then it oozes through the pores of the skin. And once the blood seeps through, it mixes with the person's sweat and it flows down their face like droplets of blood to the ground. You can look that up on Google. There are pictures of it to see what this actually looks like from people who suffer from hematidrosis. So it leaves no doubt that he was under in such an intense, painful fight and so much conflict. The dude was literally sweating blood. So in John's account, excuse me, says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples to the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received the detachment of Jews and officers of the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. So Judas goes rolling in there with this detachment of troops. 
And we might think that like it's it's a few guys, you know, some soldiers are coming to take Jesus down. And this word detachment is spira, and it means a military cohort. And a military cohort was a group of 300 to 600 soldiers, um, and they were specially trained. The Jews were under Roman occupation. These guys were specially trained to respond very quickly and to crush any uprisings that would come up. So I mean, these dudes were brutal. They were they would be the day's special forces. So 300 to 600 of these dudes are coming at Jesus. And that's, that's not the end of it, man. It says a detachment of troops and officers. These officers were the temple police. So he's got like this, this battalion of uh, seals coming at him. He's got the entire police force coming at him. And that's not the end of it either. He says that they came with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Weapons is a word that in the Greek speaks of the full weaponry of a Roman soldier. And some of you guys were here when we went through the armor of God in Ephesians 6. You understand the concept. Some of you weren't, but this is saying. These, these soldiers, they had their helmet on. They had the protection that comes down to protect the jaws. They had their breastplate on to protect all their vital organs. They had the belt that held it all together, that held their sword, that held their shield, that hung down and protected the tops of the leg. They had their shoes that had spikes in them so they could stand and not be pushed back. And they could keep the ever-loving crap out of you with them. And they had greaves attached when they came up their legs so nothing could hit the bottom of their legs. Most of these dudes also had a place in their belt for a lance so they could pull it out and take someone down at a distance too. Like these dudes were dead out. All this going for one dude, right? One dude. So what did Jesus do? He was, holy crap, that's scary. No, he didn't say that. He says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward. You gotta imagine seeing this coming at you, stepping up to it. Steps forward, right up to it, because he knew it was what God wanted him to do. This is what the Father wanted. Didn't matter how many came. Didn't matter how heavily armored they were. Didn't matter the weapons they had. Didn't matter their intent towards him. It mattered that the Father said, this is what I want you to do. So he steps up to him and he says, whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And you guys remember in uh, uh, chapter 13, we were talking about uh, Jesus having fellowship with the disciples and he washed their feet and he said, I say these things that you may know that I am he. But he is in italics in our Bibles, which means it's not there in the Greek. So he's saying, I am. That name for God from the Old Testament. When Moses saw the burning bush. He asked the names and I am who I am. So it's a reference to deity. So Jesus answers, he says to them this, I am. And Judas who also betrayed him stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. So they say, Jesus is like, what's up, bro? Who are you looking for? We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. I am. Bam. Drew back and fell to the ground. Drew back in the Greek. Um, it literally speaks of, of staggering and stumbling. And it's a picture of being hit by force. Fell is literally to fall, but it is depicting a person who fell so hard it appeared that they fell down dead. And to the ground is falling abruptly and very hard, being knocked flat. So Jesus, by the power of speaking his name, blows these dudes. You see that cat? So sick. Thank you, Lord. He blows these dudes right down to the ground. And what is he proving there, man? He's proven you cannot come and take me unless I allow it to happen. I am letting this happen. You could not do this on your own. So these dudes get blown down flat, right? And then Jesus says to me, he knocks these dudes right down. 300 to 600 dudes. And he goes, so who are you looking for, bro? <laughs> and they say again, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says to them again, I am he. Now Peter, he, man, Peter, he's all, he's all going to be God's holy gunslinger. So like, he draws out his sword and he cuts off the, the, high, servant, uh, the high priest's servant's ear. I mean, he's like, get a mother down. You know, with him for him. Jesus is fixed. He's got to clean up his mess. He's like, put your sheet away, dude. And he heals this dude's ear, right? So, for the sake of time, you need to condense this a little bit. Um, Jesus, they, they tie him up, they lead him captive, they take him to the high priest where they prepare false witnesses to testify against him, saying that he says, uh, uh, he's saying he's God, so he's going to be blasphemy, it's worthy of death. Um, they take him before Pilate. Pilate is the Roman governor who is overseeing uh, these people and, and place the emperor. He carries the full authority of the Roman emperor over these people. They take him to Pilate, 
And Pilate is, Pilate is trying to cover his butt at this point in time. There's been a few uprisings. If there's another one, he's probably going to get killed. So he's trying to do anything he can to really cover his butt. Anyway, it says, so then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. The scourge, we see pictures of scourges and like it looks like a whip and like they, they whipped him and it probably hurt a little bit. The scourge had uh, a lot of different uh, whips coming off the end of it and they were all different lengths. And at the end of these whips, they would put uh, bent sharp pieces of metal, they would put pieces of bone. So the person would be laid with their back exposed, their legs exposed. These dudes would be laid out completely naked and they would often be flipped. So you're getting a full body ass whipping going on. And they would take the scourge and when they hit you with it, because it was all different lengths, it would hit all over your body in different areas. Dig into the flesh, and then they would pull it out. And it would pull out chunks of flesh with it. There are plenty of documented cases from people dying from being scourged, uh, just from bleeding out, from going into cardiac arrest from blood loss, from actually being uh, disemboweled by having their guts caught up in this thing. So they scourge it. They scourge it front and back, head to toe. Pilate is hoping that this hardcore ass whooping is going to make the Jews go, all right, you don't need to kill this guy anymore. He was punished sufficiently enough. And that wasn't the end of it, man. It says, and then the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple rope. Then they said to him, hail king of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. They were mocking him. He's got to deal with this physical beating. Then they're mocking him. And the way that this is worded, that they struck him with their hands, and you compare it with the other Gospels, it's language talking about this entire spirit, this military cohort, hundreds of dudes just lined up, mocking him, hitting him. Hundreds of times, over and over again. Crown of thorns pushed onto his head. They put that purple robe on him. You know, you guys pulled off a band-aid? Imagine pulling off that robe after having your entire body scorched. So a few verses later, it says, And he, bearing his cross, went out to the place of the skull, which is called the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. So he had to carry this cross after this. And this was common Roman practice. He would carry the cross beam of your cross to the place where you were going to be crucified. Those who know the other Gospels know that the, the beating he took was so bad he couldn't carry it. He fell down. And another man had to come and carry it for him. And then they crucified him. They would have driven the nails into the wrist. We speak about the hands. The hands wouldn't hold it unless they were uh, roped to the cross. Maybe they weren't, maybe they weren't. I don't know. They were either roped and through the hand or they won't, were not roped and they were through the wrist. And then they would nail the feet together. And the way you die from crucifixion is you suffocate because you can't hold up your own body. Your arms are stretched out. You got to push on your feet to lift yourself up so you can take a breath. Your feet are in agony because they're nailed in place. So you can only heave up every once in a while to get a breath. And then you got to slack back down. There are cases, this would dislocate the sockets with the body weight hitting off, and the shoulders would dislocate. There's cases of arms stretching nine inches because they dislocated so far where these dudes were, were being crucified. A few verses later, it says, Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate, that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So if someone was not dying soon enough, the Jews had to take a body down and bury it before sunrise. That was their custom. That was, that was what they believed. So they were asking for these dudes' legs to be broken so they would hurry up and die because once their legs were broken, they couldn't support their weight anymore by pushing up on their feet and they would suffocate pretty quick. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And this was a sign that he was dead, because as you suffocate on the cross, what happens is your lungs fill up with fluid. So when they stabbed that spear, they hit his lungs, the fluid came out, they knew that his lungs had filled up with fluid, and he was dead, and so there was no need to break his legs. And if that ended right there, that would be terribly upsetting. So a little bit after that, these people that were following him, they go to the grave, they go to where he was buried, and he's not there. And at first they think someone stolen him, someone's taken him. Mary, Mary Magdalene, the first one to see this, she runs back and she tells the disciples, you know, he's gone. And they said that Peter and John run out to the tomb. You know, I wonder what's going through the rest of the, 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 the apostles' minds. Well, they're sitting there. Peter and John are like, 
no way, this is not happening, not to my boy. And they run out there, and these other dudes, you know, they're so scared at this point because they just saw, you know, their master. They, they saw who they knew was the son of God killed. They stay there. They're like, uh-uh, I ain't going out there. So they go out, they see the tomb. Long story short, um, Jesus shows himself to them several times. Acts talks about how hundreds of people saw Jesus resurrected. And they realize the things that he said before about how he would be resurrected from the dead, that the grave wasn't going to hold it. So here's the thing. If we don't understand how this, how this actually means something to us right here and now, like I said, all this is is a story. It's an emotional story. It's a touching story, but it's not life transforming. It's, it's just some entertainment. First thing we need to understand is that Jesus took the place of me. He took the place of you. He stood in so that we could receive forgiveness for the filth that is inside of me. God looked on me and he saw the filth that is inside of me. And he said, I'm going to bear the burden for that. This would be like if you're standing before a judge. And the judge says, your fine is $2 million. And you said, there is no possible way I could ever pay that in my life. And the judge comes down, writes a $2 million check and says, you're free to go. He took the place for us so mercy could be shown to us. And while I was talking about that court setting, when we were talking about the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, I'll send another helper. Talking about the Holy Spirit. That word helper literally means advocate. It's the word that the Greeks would use for a lawyer because it would be used for someone that would come up alongside you and help you when you couldn't help yourself. Devil, you know what that means? It means accuser. The picture here of you've got the accuser coming at you. What does it matter when you have the advocate living inside of you? Cause to take a permanent residence inside of you. How much damage can that accuser do to you if you allow the advocate to fill his role? It's when we try to stand on our own power against the accuser, we get our asses handed to us, man, because we don't understand the power that is in us. But why did Jesus do this? Why? Why would he go through all this? Obviously, he didn't want to. He was in great conflict about it. Why would he do this? First John 1 John 1.8, same dude that wrote the Gospel of John. This is a shorter letter that he wrote. It's later on in the New Testament. It says, he who sins is of the devil. And this is very important to understand. This does not mean the person who commits an occasional sin is of the devil. It specifically is speaking about a lifestyle of habitual sin that refuses to do what's right. He is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Acts 10, 38, says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Why would Jesus do this? To destroy the works of the devil, so that the Holy Spirit would be sent by the Father to take up permanent residence in us so that we are no longer held under the dominion of sin. It does not have to dominate us. There is a way out of it. Jesus shows up to these dudes after he had risen from the grave. They're locked in the room because they're scared. And he shows up in the middle of them. And he says, peace be with you. This would be like, like let's say I could kill it out in the street. Darren and Ron and Bill are hanging out in the room somewhere terrified, and all of a sudden I just show up out of nowhere and I'm like, stop, bro. <laughs> That's going to be a little disconcerting, right? It's going to be a little shocking. Jesus says, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And he spoke that to us, man. He spoke that to everyone that follows him. As the Father sent me, I send you. This is what Paul is talking about over and over again in the New Testament. He wrote a couple of examples in the book of Romans in chapter 6. He says, Therefore we were buried with him in baptism into death, that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. He says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism. I've beaten over the head the idea of baptism being immersed and submerged in something, so I'm not going to go down that road. The earliest uses of this word was spoken when garments were dyed, and it carries the image of, of taking something and introducing it to something new, to this dye. And it was held in the dye long enough to absorb everything from it, to absorb the color from it. So it was introduced to something new, and it was held there long enough to absorb all the aspects of this new thing. So it came out looking like a new garment. 
Baptism is a symbol. When we go down in that water, we are symbolizing to God our willingness to die to ourselves and die to the world and do life His way. When we come up out of that water, we are symbolizing to Him that we want to live with Christ raised. This says to walk in newness of life, empowered by the Holy Spirit that is sent to take up permanent residence in us. God doesn't ever send us out to do something and then go, dude, flipping luck, bro. He gives us a way to do it. And often, it's what we think is unpleasant and what we think is wrong with our finite way of thinking. But if we just give in and we let him do it and we let him control us instead of us trying to control the situation, he gives us a way to do it. A few verses now, Paul says, For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He talks about how to do this a couple chapters over in Romans chapter 8. He says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. He's saying you've got to die to yourself. He talks in the book of Galatians. He says, I have crucified my flesh. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He's saying my fleshly desires. He's not saying live a life with no desires, with no passion. He's saying not to let your desires for pleasure rule you, the sin that comes into our lives that is fleeting for a moment not to let it rule you. A couple verses after that in Galatians, he says all that are Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. He said, I've been crucified to the world and the world to me. He's saying my flesh, my desires don't matter. What the world throws at me does not matter. What matters is Christ and living, raised with him. In the book of Colossians, in chapter 3, it says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore is the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in spiritual hymns and songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It's a completely new way of looking at life. Where you look at things the way God does and not at the way that you do. Now, how does God create this in us, man? We were talking about bad things happening to good people. He puts us through these trials to create discipline. No one ever goes through discipline and says, this is awesome, I really enjoy this. There is no soldier in basic training that is like, yeah, this is what I signed up for, man. But afterwards, when they go through it and they come out the other side, they are transformed and it saves their life. The book of Hebrews is speaking about discipline. And it says, if you endure chasing, chasing is the same thing as discipline. So I'm just going to put the word discipline in there. If you endure discipline, God deals with you as with sons. But what son is there whom a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. So we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live. For they indeed, for a few days, chasing us has seemed best to them. But he is our prop. But he, for our prophet, has seen best. I'm sorry, I completely lost. But they indeed, for a few days, discipline us has seen best to them. He, for our prophet, that we may be partakers of his holiness. 
Now, no discipline seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So he disciplines us so that we can be closer to him, that we can appropriate these things that he brought to us. Paul talks about how we're called to this. When we're talking about trials and Peter, he was saying, this is what you are called to. This idea of God calling us, this is huge, man. Absolutely huge. If you are called, that means you are wanted. You don't call somebody unless you want them around, unless you, you want them to be there. We are wanted by God. God wants to be with us. Jesus, after he's resurrected, he hooks up with Peter and John on the beach and he cooks some breakfast. He wants to do everyday life with us. He wants to be there when we're having breakfast in the morning. He wants to be there when we go grocery shopping. He wants to be there when I'm talking to that really stinky old dude at the laundromat that always just happens to come down every single time they do laundry. He wants to be there. And he wants to go through life with us so he can show us how to transform the world. These dudes changed the world. The world is under the rule of the devil. He destroyed the power of the devil. I'll tell you what, man, if we are called and we are wanted, you know what that means when we're wanted? We are significant. If we are, you know, this is gonna keep falling. If we are significant, think about that, man. We're significant to God. Who are we to think of ourselves as worthless? Lives that are hopeless when to God we're significant. Let me tell you a story about being significant, man, and then we're gonna do communion. I'm gonna wrap this up soon, I promise. I'll tell you a story about being significant. 1851, there was this woman who nobody knew. Her name was Hattie, and she loved God very much. Her father was a fantastic preacher, a um, man who was passed on to her brother, who was also a fantastic preacher, but Hattie loved God with all her heart, and she tried with all her heart to listen to God, to do life with God. She would always be inviting Jesus into those everyday situations and doing life with him. Those seemingly small things where we say, why would God care about that? He cares about it all because we're significant. So Hattie is sitting in church. And she goes into the, basically this trance and she sees this vision. And she sees this vision of a slave who is getting beaten. And it's a very graphic vision and it's very long and goes kind of slow motion. She leaves church. She goes home. She cannot get this out of her head. She picks up paper and she starts writing this vision down. She writes and she writes and she writes. She blows through all the paper in the house. She starts writing on uh, uh, the, the brown paper they used to wrap groceries in, any kind of scraps she could find. She writes all this stuff down for this vision that she had because she was open to God speaking to her. In 1852, a year later, all that stuff she hand wrote down was published in a 45 chapter book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom's Cabin was sent out by the publishers, and the publishers said this book is not going to sell very well. It sold out the first printing in two days. It sold out the third and fourth printings before they even wrote a review of the book. So this book wound up in millions of houses in America, and this is in the 1850s, including the White House. A decade later, Abraham Lincoln meets her, and he says, so you're the little woman that started this great war. When we are significant to God, we are one little person that can start great spiritual wars. We can change the world because it's not about us. We die to us so he can operate through us. When we do that, we are one significant person to God that can change the world. So we're gonna take communion right now. And since you know, this is Rise Up, <laughs> we're gonna do communion with combos and Red Bull. And if you don't want Red Bull, then there is a cranberry juice. Bill and Jess, if you guys wanna pass those out, <laughs> no, that's how we roll, bro. Let <laughs> me tell you something about communion, man. We keep talking about this fellowship that Jesus wants to have with us, where He cleans us, and He washes our feet so we can have fellowship with Him. He says, I'm the vine, have fellowship with me so that your life bears fruit, so that your life actually changes, so that it transforms in a way that just is not possible for you to do on your own, so that God gets the glory. That word communion means the same thing as fellowship. If you were having communion with somebody, you were having fellowship with them. Let me just throw this out there. If anyone does not want to take communion, you by no means have to. That's cool. No one is going to judge you for that, and no one is going to look at you wrong for that. If what you heard is something you want in your life, then feel free to take it. Are you giving me the whole cup of combos, man? I don't, I don't need that much more. Body of Christ. <laughs> that word communion... It's the same thing as that word fellowship, man. It talks about a 
co-participation in something. Jesus wants to co-participate in life with us so bad that he says, every time you eat, remember that. Every time you drink, remember that. Tell you what, man, we talk about this physical beating that he took. You got to think about the spiritual beating that he took. He had been in fellowship with the Father since before creation. And he had to be separated from the Father. I cannot imagine what that void was like for him. What's the biblical picture of someone that dies separated from the Father? It's the definition of hell. Completely devoid of God's presence is the definition of hell. Jesus literally went through all the pain and agony of hell so we could have fellowship with God, so that we could overcome the works of the devil with our lives. God, we thank you for that. We eat and drink this in remembrance of what you've done for us. Allowing you to transform our lives through that in Jesus' name. I never had come with a bread bowl before. That tasted kind of funny. So like I said, guys, uh, next week we're going to start getting into 1 Peter when we go through, through Ephesians. Uh, if you do today, the vineyard in the morning, it's going to be very different than the vineyard going through 1 Peter. It's going to be a lot more in-depth. Uh, we are collecting tuna fish and towels all month long for the rescue mission house. Any kind of towels. Paper towels, uh, bath towels, dish towels. Not the, that, that towel from South Park. That's awesome. Good. <laughs> um, guys, if you want to come back up and play worship, Let's wrap this up. Let's pray and let's worship God for a little bit. Lord Jesus, I thank you for what you were willing to endure for us. The, the level of commitment that you had to the Father to be willing to fight a spiritual battle so intense that so that we could have fellowship with God, so we could walk in victory over the way the devil wants to pull us from the life that you have for us, that we can destroy his works for our lives, that we can live our lives in your authority. In your presence, where there is fullness of joy, and where there is transforming power that is just simply unlike anything else, so that you get the glory for it. Praise you, and we give the glory to you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.